In this lesson, we're going to be looking at what's known as emotional abuse. So what is emotional abuse? Now, while, while we're thinking about definitions, it's important to note that in the secular world, among people who do research, there is no agreed upon definition. And also when we're looking at um, what's involved in abuse, there's no agreed list of things that are involved in abuse. So the things that are repeated aspects, repeated patterns that come through have been listed extensively in various places. But nowhere will you find an agreed definition of abuse or an agreed list of behaviours that are involved in abuse. There are things that keep recurring and there are definitions that, uh, definitions that attempt to, to help us understand what abuse is. So I want to say that so just to be help be careful, help us to be aware and wise when we're dealing with abuse. It's very complicated and we need to be dependent on the Lord as we're helping people and very well informed and careful. Um, this is complicated and it's people's lives that we're, we're involved in and we need a lot of wisdom and a lot of care as we're involved with them. So this is my attempt. It's based on a definition from someone else and I've added the second aspect to it. So what is emotional abuse? Now my def this definition I give is in the light of what I've just said about being careful. So a suggested definition of emotional abuse is any non-physical behavior that's designed to control, intimidate, subjugate, punish, or isolate another person, resulting in the victim becoming emotionally, behaviorally, and mentally dependent on the abuse. I already referred to this definition in the first lecture. So it's not just someone that's being selfish and is, is hurting other people in the home. Now, someone like that does need help, but there's more to it. So it's a way, a whole way of relating. There's intending to control other people, to get them under the power. And the result of this behavior means that the victim becomes dependent on the abuser in a way that's harmful. Abuser, they're dependent on the emotions, behavior, and in their mind, which goes against the way the Lord designed us as his image bearers. So let's look at uh, types of emotional abuse or a better, better way of saying it would be uh, patterns, what's involved in emotional abuse. Now emotional abuse, emotional abuse includes verbal abuse, it's a way of speaking to someone. The Lord designed us to speak to each other in ways that are helpful, in ways that build each other up, that encourage each other, that are loving. When there's abuse people are do the opposite of that. There'll be verbal abuse, and that can involve overt uh, verbal abuse. It's really clear that someone's being nasty in what they say. That could include insults, threats, they, they, they ridicule someone. Or it could be covert, it's more hidden, where you know there's something that's not quite right, but you can't quite put your finger on it, which could be the ways of demeaning the person, jokes made about them. Um, the person is referred to not as a human being made in the image of God, but as an animal, a part of the body, part of the anatomy. Um, they could try and speak in a way that's more educated so the person doesn't understand or so they think. Uh, the, the put downs are involved. So there's verbal abuse, overt, clear and covert, more hidden. Then there's coercion and threats. So they'll usually make threats about things that, upon which the, the victim depends, such as their health needs, their finances. So they try and get them to, um, to threaten them or coerce them into doing things they don't want to do. So coercion could include um, leaving threats on a voicemail or secret messages. It could be slashing tiles. It could be things that disappear. They could threaten them. If you don't do what I'll say, then I will. Now, I know an elder in the church who was doing a lot of counselling in his church. And as a result of that, people trusted him with what with secrets in her life. And I knew a young man who'd been abused as a child by someone. And the elder, uh, he was spiritually abusive. He said to this young man, if you don't do what I want, I'll open the book on you. So this young man who's going through life, what do, what are people going to think? What If I upset him, he might tell everyone. 
Um, and the result of threatening, when you're in a close relationship with someone, the result of the threat is you never know if the person is going to carry out that threat. Now, if you're in a close relationship with someone, usually that person knows things about you that the rest of the world doesn't know. They know your secrets, especially in marriage. You know intimate details about each other's lives. Um, and if someone threatens that they're going to expose this, you would never know when they're going to carry out that threat. And that could be going on in your mind for a long time. And the result of that is that the abuser can control someone, how they spend their time, what social media they use, they engage in, what, what they look at on television, how they dress, how they cook. It can Because they are thinking, I better not upset them, and what if they end up potentially controlling all aspects of that person's life? Minimising, denying and blaming. So minimising the victim's thoughts and feelings, perceptions. If they get an achievement, minimise it. Oh, anyone can get a qualification these days. Denying, they'll deny what has been said and done. The, the common terms are things like, I never said that. You're just imagining it. I was with an a, 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 a abusive mother once and I saw her saying, saw and heard her saying something to her daughter. And the daughter went to an elder's wife. I was there. The, the daughter went to the elder's wife and said, this is what's been said. It was only two minutes later and the mother said, I never said that, but she did. And if, if you think, did I say that? Did that happen? You start doubting your own understanding, your own perceptions of what's going on in the situation. Blaming. They'll blame the victim for the situation. It's their fault. If they hadn't done that, they wouldn't have been treated in that way. Now, if you remember from the first lecture, we talked about entitlement. An abusive person believes that they're entitled to get their own way. So they'll, if, if things don't go right, it's a victim's fault. The victim has to make sure that the, the, that the abuser is not unhappy. The abuser is not angry. The abuser is not lonely. And if you don't do what they want you to do, then that's why you're being badly treated. So to get blame. And if you accept the blame, if a victim accepts the blame for abusive behaviour, that makes a victim responsible for the relationship. The abuser already thinks it's your fault and then the victim accepts it as well. It just compounds the whole issue of abuse. Intimidation. They'll try and intimidate the victim to get them to do what they want so they could come up and stand really close to them, block, block um, the doorway, uh, drive recklessly. I knew an abusive man who would drive... Uh, 30 kilometers an hour with the children in the car because he was annoyed at his wife. It was really dangerous. It was an area where you could drive 90 kilometers. So he's driving 30 with three kids in the car and everyone knew he was angry at mum. So whose fault was it? Mum. I know a, a mother who, was, who did the opposite. She would be driving top speed, run bendy roads at the last minute break and turn, trying to intimidate the victims into letting the abuser control them and do what they want. Mind games is a huge aspect of what's known as emotional abuse. Playing with your ability to think and make choices and perceive. This is where the whole aspect of um, gaslighting comes in. Gaslighting comes from a movie and a play from the 1940s, back in the day when outside in the streets there were the they used gas lamps to to light the street and they in the movie they played with the amount of gas so that the person thought that they were going crazy so gaslighting is about crazy making you think you're losing it so for example you might leave your car keys in the same place all the time you go and look for your car keys they're not there uh, you search for them everywhere you go and report to the police that you've lost your car keys you come back home and they're where, there where they've been all the time. You think, what did I do? How come, how come I thought they weren't there? It could be, I've already mentioned, denying it. And it could also include things like insisting that he gets his steak cooked well done. All of his life, you made the, cook, the steak well done. And then all of a sudden he said, you know that I, I like my steaks rare. What a stupid, and then a whole tired of, accusations and insults so the next time she makes a steak rare and he d says exactly the same about it needing to be well done 
So you start doubting your ability to understand, your ability to trust in your mind. You think you're going crazy. And what you end up doing is the victim goes to the abuser to get insights, to, to be able to understand what's going on. And therefore, in their thinking, they become dependent on the abuser. They're not thinking in a way according to who they are as God's image bearer. Isolation. The, the, the abuser will do all sorts of little tricks to get the victim to live just for them. For example, they might act up, be badly behaved when there are other people around. Or um, be, be, if the victim wants to go somewhere, they'll be horribly behaved before they go. And horribly behave when they come back. Or they might insinuate things about family members, about the family members being against them. So they isolate the, the victim. They lose the support and the other people that can speak into their lives. And in this way, the, the abuser is more able to control them. Personal privilege. And by that I mean the position that they have in society or in relationships that gives them an advantage or a place of responsibility over the victim. That could be in, in as a husband, his greater physical strength usually, and his the whole idea of headship if that is abused, abuse of wives. Usually the system is geared in the favor of women, so they could abuse the system and falsely accuse the husband. In a church, it would be the position, spiritual position. Um, in a family, parent child, it's a parent position. It's a position of personal privilege. Is used to their is, is abused to their advantage. Financial control, they might take away their ability to get money. Before the the time of smartphones, I I knew a man who would take away his wife's bank card, and she was totally dependent on him. He would not give her enough money to feed the family. She was totally dependent on him for for the minimum that she got. And she would only get enough if she if she did what he wanted. Uh, so financial control, and especially when it comes to mothers with kids, the financial control they don't want to see their children harmed. So they 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 want to be able to provide for the children to give them the the care that they need. So a lot of the time, if they're being controlled financially, they they they'll put up with the bad behavior or give in to it because they want to care for the children. Just what I'm saying, using the children, they could, if if the the if it's a wife, for example, and she starts resisting the abuse, the abuser might start abusing the children or turn the children against her. And a lot of they take mothers, for example, they will rather be mistreated themselves usually than that the children suffer harm. So they'll go back to being treated badly so that they're protecting the children. But while this is really understandable, in the long term, it's more harmful because. The children will be getting a bad example. They're seeing uh, what marriage should be. And also it is harmful in the children in the long term. Remember I said the more you give in to abuse, the worse it gets. So it's really understandable. But in the long term, it's, it's worse for the children as well. And having two personalities. By that I mean that um, at home, they're behaving in this terrible way. But outside the home, they're perceived as being, being really good people. Secular researchers have even discovered people who um, at home are abusive and outside the home stand up for women's rights or fight against abuse. In the church situation, this could be someone who's abusive at home and at church is seen as a very spiritual person who prays with people, who cares for people, who goes out of their way to give practical help to people and are seen as loving, but at home they're not. So what's going to happen if the abuse victim then says to someone that they're being treated in such a way? And usually, when, if you remember how we talked about the effects of abuse, if the effects of abuse are having this harmful effect on the victim, you'll see that in them. You'll see that in how they look and how they go through life. So who are you going to believe? This person that's a victim that I just described or this caring, godly person that they're accusing of being abusive? And what's going to happen is then probably they won't be believed and may be treated with suspicion. So having two personalities is really important to be aware of this in situations of abuse. And it shows the importance of really getting to know the people that are involved and all that's going on in the home. 
jealousy. Remember in the first lesson we talked about abusers are people who feel entitled. So they'll be jealous if someone else gets attention or achievement that they, they don't have. They get jealous. Life is about them. You exist for me, right? So you can't get anything I can't have. And lastly, good periods. This is really important as Christians because we pray for the Lord to change people. I've heard people say to me, yes, and the Lord can change anyone, which is true. The Holy Spirit can change anyone. Our Lord died on the cross and rose again. And he did this, making it possible for anyone to change. And I've seen the Lord change abusive people. At the same time, good periods is part of the pattern of abuse. People can behave well until the, the heat is gone, things have cooled down, and then they'll revert back to the abusive behavior. I used to work for someone in a Christian organization, and he would say, when you see that you have been treated, that you, he was talking about himself. He so said, when, when you see that um, you, you've reached the limit, and you can't get away with it, back off until everything calms down and then start again. It's a terrible way of, of, of relating. It's not about our Lord. Secular researchers, they, they were talking about people who were sent to um, court-mandated help for abuse for two years. And as soon as the date was finished for their court-mandated help, they went back to their abusive behaviour. So that what I'm meaning by this is we need to be very wise. Yes, the Lord can change anyone. And as I said, I've seen the Lord change abusive people. But good periods are part of the pattern. And to be very wise, not just to believe someone that started behaving better, but to see, are they repentant? Do they own their sin? Do they apologize? Do they repent? Do they ask for forgiveness? And are they learning to change? Over the long term, not just a couple of months, but even as I said, remember I said, Secular researchers have observed this over two-year periods. So it's got to be really important. Good periods are, that's a point that's really important. Good periods are part of the whole pattern of abuse. So this has been lesson two, looking at some of the behaviours that are involved in emotionally abusive behaviour.